The hero and villain dynamic is so ingrained in the very fiber of comic books that it's almost impossible to find a hero without at least one deep, compelling nemesis in mainstream comic books. Superman has Lex Luthor, Batman has the Joker, Spider-Man has the Green Goblin, and the Fantastic Four have Doctor Doom. It's because it gives our heroes a test that only a certain villain can offer. And because of this, a hero could have a rogues gallery of villains to test them. The Joker can test Batman if he's actually able to bring peace and stability to Gotham. But a villain like Scarecrow can test Batman's use of fear. The same can go for villains like Kingpin, who can test multiple heroes on what greed and power can do to someone. So why is it then, in the live-action adaptations, supervillains tend to almost always be an afterthought? They can appear in one movie, fight their given hero, and then never be heard from again. Suppose you look at the entirety of the MCU. Every film had a villain. Almost all of them end up losing to the hero and had the same fate of either being dead or presumed dead to reappear later with almost no involvement in the meantime. In some cases, they might actually turn out to be a hero a few films later. And yet, it's very rare that they actually leave an impact on the story into the next film. And if they do, well, it's probably brushed aside by the end of Act 1. And this isn't just a Marvel thing. DC has been arguably worse at adapting their villains. Only three traditionally main antagonists appear. Lex Luthor took a backseat to everything else that happened in Dawn of Justice. Jared Leto's Joker, who only ever shares screen time with Batman and over-the-shoulder shots in the Snyder Cut. Or... It's Black Manta, who was treated like such an afterthought in the first Aquaman movie, and despite being the one to push along the plot in the second film, he's still just kind of secondary to the story of two brothers. So what gives? What is it about modern-day superhero films that lead us to overlook the villains? Why are they so forgettable? And what can be done to fix them? Let's get into it. To begin, I believe it does begin with a breakdown of the fundamentals of screenwriting. We should probably analyze how any villain serves the story. There are several fundamental building blocks that are necessary to the story, regardless of whatever you're trying to tell. You need a protagonist, the central figure that the audience can ground themselves in, and they become the focal point of the story. For superhero films, they're always the titular hero or group. You need a plot. What does every step in the journey look like to the protagonist? The physical journey that the hero undertakes, in turn, becomes the events of the film. And you need a story. In screenwriting terms, this differs from the plot because it's actually about what the writer is trying to say with their work. The moral of the story, if you will. What does the protagonist learn, or what do they reveal about themselves and the world around them? The easiest way that I can put it is to think of the plot as the physical journey, and the story as the emotional and psychological one. John McClane stops Hans Gruber and his men on Christmas Eve, but he, like us the audience, learns about the indomitable will of one man trying to save his estranged wife. And finally, you need obstacles, the thing that the protagonist needs to overcome. And if done right, these obstacles should highlight why we care about the hero. They should be interesting enough to carry the plot. And of course, what is it about the obstacle that forces the protagonist to learn the story? In most traditional stories, and especially with superhero films, this obstacle is personified by a villain. They should be an ever-present challenge that is trying to prevent the hero from reaching their goals. The dark mirror opposite of the hero, or what could happen to them if they don't learn the moral of the story. But most importantly, what does this journey to stop the villain say about our hero? In my opinion, I think there are four elements that make a supervillain, well, super. 1. They need to be an obstacle to the plot. Can't just have the good guys walk all over them at every opportunity. Goku can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the villains who are stronger than him, but if Raditz showed up a few years later when Goku was already a Super Saiyan, he'd be a joke. 2. They need to be an obstacle to the story. Does the villain make the protagonist become a better hero by the end of the film? If the hero is already a paragon of truth and justice in the beginning, let's put them to the test. Captain America can act all heroic on film, but will all of that waver when he loses his best friend? 3. Their motives need to make sense in the world that they're in. If a villain is just evil for the sake of evil, and is only focused on gaining power, that's kind of lazy and isn't interesting. But if we're talking about the Emperor in Star Wars? Yeah, we are invested enough into the story to believe that he's actually able to take over a galaxy in the name of the dark side of the Force. All because the most evil person we've seen up until that point kept kneeling to him for two movies before we finally saw the Emperor in the flesh. This should also tie into another key element of screenwriting. There need to be stakes. Too few stakes can be boring. There's nothing to keep the audience engaged if you're just watching a film about a guy going to a grocery store. So executives tend to oversteer too hard and try to make every blockbuster film feel like an event film because the safety of the world is at stake. But just because the stakes are high and the world is in danger doesn't mean that makes the villains any more interesting nor the hero any more triumphant when they save it. We actually see the opposite effect on the film's quality. Here's a list of all of the details DCEU films with what I would consider world-ending stakes. And here are the ones that scored higher than a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Even when we look at the MCU, same thing. The only outlier is Avengers Endgame, which was built on universe-ending stakes, 
but there is a difference. The heroes all feel like Thanos' motivation to restart the universe matter, which makes us, the audience, actually think it matters. That's why personal stakes pull out our heartstrings so much more. We don't really care if the villain in X-Men 3 is trying to wipe out all of the mutants, because Wolverine is too cool to care about that. But seeing him go through hell just to save a little girl, and the main villain just kidnapped her, now these stakes matter. But back to finishing my supervillain puzzle. This one kind of wraps up everything together, yet is the hardest to get right. There needs to be, at the very least, a tiny seed of doubt that the villain could win in the end. Whenever we watch a movie, there's always certain expectations that come along with each genre. When you're watching a rom-com, you can expect that the two leads will more than likely get together by the end. When you're watching a slasher film, you can expect that not all of the rambunctious teenagers are going to make it out of there alive. Spaghetti westerns, the cowboy will save the day. Neo-westerns, the cowboy will save the day, but probably isn't going to go home afterwards. And in superhero action films, you can see the hero take quite a few licks, but we all know they will ultimately triumph. It comes down to this. Has the story made us suspend our disbelief enough to actually believe that the hero might actually lose? Or if they do win, at what cost? So let's take a look at several villains that do this right and several that do it wrong. The Joker in the Dark Knight. He's never a physical threat to Batman, but he's still able to put him through enough hell that it takes a lot out of Bruce. 4 out of 5. The Joker sets up a test for the very soul of Gotham that Batman can't intervene to prove that these people are indeed worth saving. 5 out of 5. Every other bad guy has a reason. They want money. They want power. The Joker, he just wants to watch the world burn. 5 out of 5. And the Joker knew that he couldn't win in a fist fight, but his victory condition was to prove that people could be corrupted. And he was right. Harvey Dent turned evil, and Batman must let the world think that he was the one to kill Two-Face to keep the people believing in the system. 5 out of 5. Thanos in Infinity War. He beat every single hero one-on-one. -on -one. He forces most heroes to make a sacrifice. He simply wants to use the Infinity Gauntlet to stop suffering in his own weird, twisted way. And even before the snap, our hearts dropped further and further as he just kept collecting stone after stone after stone. Sure, in these two examples, the seed of doubt came from the fact that the villains actually won. But even Wen Wu from Shang-Chi still hits all of the high notes. A martial arts master with thousands of years of training, with unexplained powerful bands. Shang-Chi needs to fight his own dad, and every experience that he had growing up to prove that he's actually able to be a hero. Wen Wu was driven by the grief over the loss of his wife, and grief can do terrible things to a person. And... We were at the start of Marvel's Phase 4, and Chang-Chi was the very first story into this new saga. This great evil being released into the world could actually spark future events. It didn't, but it was still just the tiniest bit of doubt. Sticking with Shang-Chi, the Dweller in Darkness. In case you forgot, it was the giant tentacle dragon thing at the end of the film, and who I guess would be considered world-ending stakes. But he's not the main villain, so I'm not going to change the graphic. It's kind of weird that the Dweller in Darkness was just thrown in haphazardly, because it's actually an eternal being older than the universe itself, and is actually the manifestation of fear. And it's basically the antithesis to the Phoenix Force, who looks like a mind flayer who hits the gym constantly. And then Shang-Chi instantly KOs it with a Kamehameha. It doesn't affect Shang-Chi in the slightest emotionally, and we only know that it wants to consume souls for reasons. And after it locked eyes with Shang-Chi, who now wields all these new fancy toys, yeah, it was over. Shang-Chi doesn't even break a sweat, nor did it even seem phased that he just killed an immortal demon. The fight meant nothing to him, so it means nothing to us, the audience. And the villain of the Justice League film isn't faring much better. The heroes crack jokes as they squash the parademons. The only real story is that the team is coming together, and it's more about the overall threat than specifically him. No motivations for him other than what's hinted at for Darkseid later on, and of course we knew he was going to lose. The team needed to be together just to fight Darkseid eventually. Bonus points if you can actually tell me his name. They actually say it 15 times in the theatrical version, and 10 times in the Snyder Cut. And I'm just saying, he's that forgettable of a villain. Which brings me to the heart of the problem of why villains are just so bland these days. I think it's because of the way that the franchise model has been built means there's no room for actual tension. Even before Avengers Endgame, we already had the trailer for Spider-Man Far From Home, so we already knew that we were going to see Spider-Man come back somehow from being dusted. We already had the answer to the, will the heroes win an Endgame, in the back of our minds. On the surface, this makes sense. Spider-Man is a big enough name to draw on the average viewer. It's his name in the title of the film, after all. And it's his likeness that gets made into all the toys that kids are more than likely going to have their parents buy. The draw is the hero, not the villain. Especially when you look at attempts by Sony to give the villains a solo film. All of the focus goes into making the hero look as good as possible, and I absolutely get it. But it's in this franchise model of superhero stories bred between a sprawling, interconnected film series, that's the problem. 
and the villain stopped being an integral part of the superhero mythos and are now just treated as the monster of the week and the newest episode of the MCU. Brushing off the villains is a symptom of treating every film and television show connected to a shared universe as only the bigger picture and not the individual film. But no one's going to care about the final product if every piece in it just makes a Frankenstein's monster of unoriginality. And yet, there's one villain that has bucked this trend and proved that there's still hope that standalone villains can be done right. He wasn't built up over years of Easter eggs, he isn't planned to be used in any major crossover film, and he managed to give our hero grief, challenged his very ideals, and made everyone look stronger because of his presence. Killmonger. He managed to strip T'Challa of his throne and powers the very first time they met. He challenged his entire ideals about Wakandan isolationism. He was very much a fully realized character who can star in his own project. And yes, we believe that Killmonger could achieve his objective. Sure, he wanted the throne, and absolutely, he loses the fight at the end of the film. But it was never to get power to have power. His goal was to use the throne because he saw that there should be more done to help the African diaspora. And to that end, it wasn't the way he imagined, but Killmonger actually did win at the end of Black Panther. That's how villains are done right. We know that the good guy is scheduled to appear later, so the question of, can the good guy outpunch the bad guy, is almost always a resounding, of course they will. But if the villain wants something more than just to beat up the hero, then there's something that the audience can latch on to. And when our heroes are challenged and overcome what we, the audience, actually see as an obstacle, it only makes us see the good guys as that much stronger. But what do you guys think? Who do you think are the best and worst supervillains in film? Let me know in the comments down below. And before I go, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who has followed me over the last year. This video was scheduled to go up on my one year anniversary of making comic book content on YouTube. Keep an eye out for more interesting things with my membership community and merch soon. But of course, the best way to help me out is that if you like this video, please hit that like button and subscribe for more weekly content on comic books and nerd stuff. I've been Eric, and you've... Ben Awesome.